Hey everyone, welcome back. I'm Lon Schiffbauer, and today we are going to talk about how global trade actually builds wealth. Now, this is one of the grand assertions of international business that it builds wealth for everyone involved, but how does it do that? Well, that's what we're going to explore today. So let's come on over here and let's start exploring this idea. Now, first of all, why do we trade? Why do we trade with other countries? Well, as it says here, countries that specialize in the manufacture of a product can do so more efficiently. This increases the quality and decreases the costs for customers all around the world. Okay, fine. Makes sense, I guess. Well, let's look at how it makes sense. First of all, Let's ask ourselves the obvious question, why not make everything ourselves? We're, I mean, we're smart, we have resources, we have capabilities, why not make everything ourselves? And, and in fact, why not make everything we need and then sell the excess, right? Just export, don't import. Why not just sell and not buy? Well, there's an actual school of thought around this called mercantilism. And mercantilism is an economic philosophy advocating that countries should simultaneously encourage exports and discourage imports. So encourage exports, discourage imports. Okay, I like the idea. Why not just sell and not buy? Because you can't do everything. You can't do everything. You can't do everything. And really, a country is just a big you, right? No country can make everything it needs in terms of products and services, let alone cost effectively, efficiently, high quality, all that. All right. Um, what you'll find is when we do make the decision to just make something ourselves, a given country, it's actually really, really expensive. And in this lecture series, we're going to talk about why it's expensive and yet why sometimes we might choose to do so. But for the most part, mercantilism is a pretty outdated concept. Yes, I know it bubbles up now and again in national and international politics, but for the most part, mercantilism has been replaced. It has been replaced by ideas such as absolute advantage and then the quintessential perfect solution, comparative advantage. Okay, so let's talk about absolute advantage and comparative advantage. All right. Now, absolute advantage is when a country has the ability to produce more of a good or service than anyone else. They just are really good at making a ton of this stuff, right? So if you or your country make something really well and make a ton of it more than anyone else, you have an absolute advantage because you make more. Okay, that's great. That's fine. In fact, it's really great. It's really fine. But there's something better. There's something better when it comes to building wealth around the globe. And that is comparative advantage. Now, comparative advantage is a little tricky. So we're going to explore it in some depth. All right. First, let's understand the dictionary definition. The ability of a country to produce a product at a lower opportunity cost than another country, which is to say is more efficient compared to another country due to specialization. All right. So in this case, the grand phrase, well, I just crossed it out. I shouldn't have crossed it out, is opportunity cost. OK, Lon, well, next time, choose the right color. Opportunity cost, that bad boy right there. Let's explore that one, okay? Opportunity cost is the value of what you have to give up 
in other words, what you can't produce, because you're using those resources to make something else. All right. So let me put it this way. Let's say that we're either going to make wine or we're going to make cheese. All right. We're going to make one or the other. Now, we can't really do both well, and we'll explore that here in a moment. But just for the sake of this definition of opportunity cost, we have a finite number of resources, finite labor, finite time, finite, finite uh, uh, money. Yeah, that, that thing, money. Um, we only have so much. So are we going to make wine or are we going to make cheese? Well, the opportunity cost is whatever the value is of that thing we chose not to make, right? So, for example, if you're watching this video right now, you could be watching something else. The value of that something else to your life is your opportunity cost. And hopefully this video has some value. We'll see. Okay. All right. So, how does this work in comparative advantage? Well, let's look at a hypothetical situation. This is completely hypothetical, all right, just to kind of demonstrate. Let's first look at absolute advantage, all right? And we're going to look at France and Italy, all right? And each one of these countries has to choose whether or not they're going to make wine or if they're going to make cheese, okay? now. France can make 20 units of wine or 10 units of cheese. They can't do both. It's either or. They can either make 20 units of wine or 10 units of cheese. Now, Italy can make either 30 units of wine. They're pretty good at making wine. Or 22 units of cheese. They're even better at cheese, right? So pretty awesome. Well, now, in this case, Italy has an absolute advantage in both wine and cheese. Awesome. So make both, right? No, remember, they can't do both finite resources, right? They need to make one or the other. All right, so which one? Well, when we look at comparative advantage, we see that Italy has a comparative, comparative advantage in the cheese, right? Because one unit of cheese costs only 1.36 units of wine when you figure out the opportunity cost. Um, whereas France, one unit of wine only costs half a unit of cheese. Now, granted, yes, if we look at Italy here, they're even more efficient in cheese than France. However, their efficiency in wine is greater than their efficiency in cheese. Therefore, when it comes to comparative advantage, France should focus on making the wine and Italy should focus on making the cheese. Okay. Now, remember, I said, Shouldn't Italy just make both? Well, they can't. Limited resources. We talked about that. If you're going to put your resources into something, what are you going to put it in? But there's another reason that comparative advantage makes it advantageous, advantageous for everyone to specialize. All right. Let's say for a moment that each country does 50-50. I'm going to take half my resources and put it in the wine and half my resources and put it in the cheese. That way we're all making it, right? Well, that doesn't really work so well, all right? First of all, you lose economies of scale. Now, economies of scale are what allow us to be able to make more and more product at a lower and lower unit cost. So the more product we make, the lower the unit cost. But if we are not making as much product, our unit cost goes up because of fixed cost and so forth. Now, we won't go into depth on that in this particular lecture, 
but go ahead and, and do a quick primer on economies of scale. And you'll see you want to figure out what you do best and put your resources into that. Another one is you'll have a reduction in core competency. Listen, you might be really, really good at making wine, but you're excellent at making cheese. Okay, but if you spread your competency, then odds are your, your competency, your ability to make really high quality cheese and wine will degrade because you're spreading yourself too thin. You know, think about what you do in your life, right? You do two or three things really, really well. So, well, heck, that's what people pay you to do. Or you're trying to develop your competency in some other areas. So, excuse me, so an employer will pay you more, okay? Um, it's the same thing here. You just want to get really, really good at one thing. But here is the magic of comparative advantage. You can actually create more wealth for everyone involved by specializing in just one thing. Let me show you how that works, okay? Now, let's take our 50-50 scenario for a moment, and let's pretend for a moment that there is no loss for opportunity cost, which there would be, but We'll set that aside for a moment. And let's pretend there would be no loss for core competency, which there would be, but we'll set that aside for a moment. We are just going to run with the numbers, okay? So France goes ahead and makes 10 units of wine, five units of cheese, and each one is worth $10, okay? I know that's cheap wine. I know that's expensive cheese, but just for the sake of this demonstration. All right. Now, that means that they earn $150 on that. Italy, meanwhile, makes 15 units of wine and 11 units of cheese, $10 each. And so they earn 260 That means that we have $410 in total wealth created between the two countries. Okay, but now what if they focus on their comparative advantage? Well, France would make all the wine, $10 each, earning 200 bucks. Italy would make all the cheese at 20, 22 units at $10 each, earning $220. That means that the total wealth created between the two countries is now $420, going up $10 between the two nations. Now, you might say, well, hold on, that's because things went up for France, but Italy kind of took it in the shorts a little bit. Well, in this one instance, and if this is what the whole world economy ran on, that'd be a problem. But the thing is, countries are constantly improving their comparative advantage and their their able to make more in one area than in another. Furthermore, France is earning all that money, a lot more than they did before, so they can buy more cheese, which means the cheese market would go up. The point is, comparative advantage allows wealth to grow for everyone involved, okay? So that's kind of the magic of this scenario. By the way, if you're interested, does United States, for those of you that are here in the United States, does it have a comparative advantage in anything? Yeah, the U.S. tends to be pretty good at pharmaceuticals and medical equipment, big old industrial engines and semiconductors, telecommunications, aircraft, aircraft engines. Now, that doesn't mean that we're the only ones that make this stuff. Take aircraft and aircraft engines. I'll tell you what, Rolls Royce and and um, um, oh gosh, the European, the Euro. Oh gosh, what's the European airlines, folks? What's the Air European airlines? I'm gonna have to throw that. Um, Airbus. Thank you for those of you that were sending telepathic images to me from the future to the past. Airbus. 
Airbus makes really awesome aircraft and really awesome aircraft engines along with Rolls-Royce. Rolls-Royce also makes uh, engines for, for cruise ships. The point is you can have several countries with a comparative advantage in the same thing, but that's fine because there's a huge world market, right? Okay. Now, here's something we need to really understand, though. If we're going to follow comparative advantage, and as you see, it makes pretty good sense to follow that, that economic theory, this necessarily means offshoring and outsourcing, okay? Because you're going to buy your goods and services from whomever does it the best, most economically lowest opportunity cost. And since that is often not yourself, it means you're going to buy these goods and services from someone else around the world. This is offshoring and outsourcing. Let's define these two practices first and then talk about them for a moment. Now, Outsourcing is when you move work to a vendor that then provides that good or service to the company at a lower cost and higher quality than you would do yourself. So, for example, here in the United States, many, many companies use a payroll vendor called ADP. So if you're in the United States and you receive a paycheck, there's a better than fair chance that ADP is actually the one who processed your paycheck, not your employer. Now, why wouldn't an employer just do it themselves? Because that's not their core competency. I've got news for you. Running a payroll operation that has to take multiple states and multiple counties and multiple regions and multiple countries into account is a Herculean task. That is a core competency in and of itself. And a company who's out there making wine isn't going to bother with trying to do all that themselves. They're going to outsource that. Okay? Now, outsourcing is different from offshoring. Offshoring is when you simply move work overseas. OK, so, for example, um, moving an assembly plant jobs, some assembly plant jobs from, say, the U.S. to Malaysia, which I've done. OK, in my case, it wasn't assembly plant jobs. It was HR jobs. Here's the here's the point. If you take jobs and move them overseas, that is offshoring. Now, it doesn't have to be with a different company, right? That would be outsourcing and offshoring. Um, here, let me put it this way. If I am a U.S. company and I outsource my payroll to ADP, a U.S. company, I believe, I have outsourced it. However, if I move my payroll to a company in Switzerland, I have both outsourced and offshored. But in this example of this picture, if I am Intel Corporation and I move work over to China, she's from China, or India, no, no, she's Malaysia, or India, or Israel, but there's still Intel employees, I have offshored that work. And when I was with Intel Corporation, I offshored a lot of work, including my, my, my own job, from the United States to Malaysia, okay? Because it made the most sense. Now, here's the thing about um, outsourcing. It gets a bum rap. Everybody all freaks out about the idea of outsourcing. But, but I, I want to recalibrate your thinking here for a, minute, a moment. All paid jobs, including yours, exist because somebody chose to outsource that work. Do you work for a bank? You work for a bank because I'm not going to do my own banking. I outsource that. Do you work for an oil refinery? 
you work for an oil refinery because I don't refine my own fuel, my own petrol, my own gasoline. I outsource that. Um, do you work for a manufacturing company that makes cameras? Well, you have that job because I'm buying cameras from you because I'm not making my own. Okay. Which brings me to the next point. You outsource the vast majority of your needs. The vast majority of your needs. You do not refine your own gasoline. You, for the most part, do not grow your own crops. You do not raise your own livestock if you eat livestock. You do not build your own roads. You do not make your own clothing. Um, you do not make your own shoes. You do not make your own cars. You do not launch your own satellites. You do not make your own phones. You do not... You, you, you see... All that stuff exists because you outsourced it. And in the same way, your job exists because somebody else outsourced it to you or the company that you work for. So outsourcing is the norm, not some devious thing that somebody, some amoral company does. Now, <laughs> that being said, there are plenty of companies that practice outsourcing and offshoring in immoral, unethical ways, to be sure. But for the most part, it's the rule. Okay? So, folks, there you go. I hope you found this helpful. And um, stick around. We've got a whole lot more coming on. So until then, we'll see you later.